Welcome to the Zero to Five Million Dollar Podcast. I'm Sean Finder, and I'm with my co-host Ollie Whitfield. This show is brought to you by AutoClose, a vanilla soft company. Ollie, why don't you uh, not introduce today's guest, but also just tell us what we're going to be talking about today? We're bleeding Reddit dry. Um, I'm kidding. Uh, I really enjoyed the Reddit founder questions, the sales questions, the marketer questions. And uh, I think we even said in a previous episode, we'd maybe look at some customer success questions that people have got. And, um, you know, I know that you've been in this position before. But was it Jeffrey Finder you posed yourself as to be a CSM person or was it something else? You, you had like a spoofy name of yourself, right? So listen, when you, when you, when you start a company, you got to be a little bit crafty. Uh, so initially what I did was um, I had Jeffrey Finder as our support in CSM early. I only had three employees. And what I did was uh, during the day, I, you know, I'd sometimes be Sean Finder, the CEO, making those big decisions. And sometimes I'd be in support in CSM working with our clients just because we we really got lucky that early on we, we, get, we got some really big clients. And I knew with one of them especially – if I told them I only had three employees, I probably wouldn't get that contract. Um, so we always had to pretend we we're about, at that point, about eight to 10x the, the size we were. And having Jeffrey Finder in there, um, even creating a LinkedIn for Jeffrey Finder and everything was one of the things we had to do early on just so that our customers felt like it wasn't just Sean Finder answering everything. So yeah, Ollie, that was one of the little uh, tips and tricks I had early on. I was finding that funny. Like They didn't think... Jeffrey, Jeffrey, when I go on a Zoom with him, sounds a lot like Sean, but they never quite got it. I always find that funny. Well, the funny thing is, do you know where the Jeffrey comes from? I don't know. It's my middle name. So it was actually still wow, part of Sean. On, man. So <laughs> it's Sean Jeffrey Finder. So there we, that's how we got that whole thing. So when people say it's Jeffrey, I'm like, well, that's just people call me by my, my middle name. You shouldn't have told me that. Now, uh, you, uh, in Slack, can I change someone's nickname in Slack? Let me see. <laughs> I don't think I can. That is unfortunate. You were about to become Jeffrey. I'm sorry. But um, I'll let everybody know just in case they didn't. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get into it. So um, if, you've, if you've listened to the podcast before, or if you've seen this series, then you know we're going to go through maybe five or six questions on a certain topic from Reddit. And, uh, and these are customer success ones. So um, first one, are you ready? Let's go. All right. So NPS surveys, I'm going to test your knowledge straight off the bat. What does NPS mean, Sean? NPS surveys. Crickets, tumbleweeds. You, you, you he got, doesn't know. You got me on this one. Net promoter score. It's basically a out of 10, like 10 out of 10 would recommend to uh, to appear. Okay. So quick question for the community regarding collecting client sentiment. How do your companies collect client sentiment? Do you use NPS surveys or CSAT scores? Specifically, would you recommend sending out a score of 1 to 10 and uh, measure the current satisfaction score based on that or alternate methods. What would you do? So as you didn't know what that meant, Sean, I'm, I'm wondering what you've done. <laughs> I, well, I will tell you this. Uh, you know, The one thing people don't realize is when you're early on, you're starting to grow a company, you don't care about NPS, you don't care about CSAT, you don't care about any of that stuff because the number one thing you're trying to do is A, grow your company and build your customers, keep your your, your current existing customers as like what a CSM role does, but you know, we didn't have any time at that point to implement all these smaller things to rate from one to ten. And and to personally, whenever I get those one to tens, either I don't fill it out or I just put a number so they never email me again. Um, but what we really did was we always asked for feedback. So we actually asked for feedback on the call. Um, when we had when we had our account CSM on the team, we get feedback um, or we would do surveys. Uh, one of the things we like to do is always have our clients let us know what features they want in the future. So we do surveys saying which would help you guys. So being very interactive, but we never did any of those uh, one to 10 scores um, on uh, on our clients. Well, that's until I came on board. And uh, at that point, it was part of the wheelhouse in some way or another. I didn't start it at all. But um, I know that we, on by far product lines for Nilsoft and Autoclose, we do have NPS um, out of 10. You can do it from various different tools so sometimes i believe we have uh i think it's zendesk i think i think i think i'm not sure could be wrong um they enable you to put like a quick pop-up in the app if you have an app and it has like a, an upside down unhappy face a middle like okay face and then a happy green face and if you click on the green one you kind of get a score of like seven to ten or Very cool. the middle was like four to seven or 
the the bad one is like zero to three or something and like you that. Get to so customize sense, that. Do you get to customize what you consider a good, like eight to 10 or seven to 10 and what you consider yeah. medium and what you consider poor? And other things come into that as well, depending on like the complexity of your tool. So it might be um, if they log in every day, that's a good sign. Yeah. So you get like a certain attributed score for that type of thing. So um, we, we do MPS. Um, we look at NRR, which is a completely different thing, net revenue retention. And that's that's sort of our North Star. Any service company, any software, they kind of want to keep and retain and build upon their client base. So MPS is like a secondary. That's like, a, are we happy with the pulse of clients? But the the like the contributing factor after that is NRR. So yeah, that's that one. But All I right. feel like, do you feel like those those kind of rankings are more in the B two B world or more in the B two C world? Because I've seen a lot of those one to tens in the B two C world. Do you see it common in the B two B world? Uh, pretty common. Yeah, I, I don't know if I've seen it in B two C because it's quite transactional, isn't it? There's not necessarily returning or repeat business as much as b2b i I don't know um i think it's more a little bit high ticket you wouldn't get you know five dollar deal nps you would get thousand dollar deal or monthly spend nps that's everything yeah all right so next one csm issues i love the title of that hi i would like to know your opinion on the following topics you're in a kickoff meeting with your point of contact who is your client and they would like and they let you know that they will be the only person using the platform over the coming year. How would you respond to that? So we're at the kickoff meeting with a point of contact. Yeah. And, and I think what slightly confused me too here is they've not necessarily said that this isn't what you expected. So the person on the kickoff call is now going to be the only user of the platform over the coming year, which I assume is contracted. So potentially we were expecting more than one person to show and to be using because they've paid for potentially more. Okay. So they paid for say, five people and the one person came on for the CSM to kind of go through the account. Yeah. But what's the question he's asking? What do you do? So I might carry on reading. So the client is supposed to have 10 people on the platform, but you notice only a few of them have registered and only one has shown up to the onboarding. Okay. Maybe I should have read the whole thing first. Um, so yeah, we're getting not as quite as much engagement as we would like. And uh, it looks like a fair percentage of them have not, done anything whatsoever yet so i mean I, I would i would definitely do the csm and go the onboarding for those two people saying up and running but i would have it recorded because sometimes unless you're charging you know some companies charge for that that onboarding and setup um but if only two people show up and they have 10 people they're looking for you have two come on you record it and you send it to the other eight and if they want another one you know you you you, you specifically maybe your contractor your first people say you guys get one hour of onboarding you guys decide when you want to do that. Do you want to do it with the two people? Well, then that's your one hour. Or if you want to wait, we can do it with all 10 people. But if they choose to do it with only the two people, then I would record it and then send it to the other people because um, time is money. And if, you, if you've told them to come on them and they've only brought two of the 10, you know, that's their responsibility to bring everyone else to that onboarding. Yeah. And as much as if, you, if you're not paying for the onboarding and you can't just do 10 calls, which could be one or, or even two at, at worst case, like – you can offer another time, but I'm with you on that. It's kind of, it, you've got to do your best, but not at the risk of just annihilating your diary because they couldn't, you know, show engagement. Not every time is a client going to actually engage. For some reason, these things weird, weirdly happen. Yeah. And I've got a second question here just before I move on. Your point of contact informs you that they will be leaving the company within a month of you starting and the successor to their role is not known yet. What do you do at that point? Well, if they're leaving the company, then there's no really point of doing a CSM onboarding with them. What I would do is um, offer a few things. I would say, listen, why don't you pause your subscription or pause your your uh, account until that new person's in there for a month and then give the onboarding to that new person that comes into the role? Because there's no point of giving an onboarding to somebody that's going to be leaving in three weeks because A, um, it's wasting your time. It's wasting their time. And if they're not actually going to share that information, they might not share it properly because they're you know one foot out the door. Um, it might just be a waste of everyone's time. Um, that's what I would do. Wouldn't go to their one up. Wouldn't go to their senior and and sort of pose the question. I mean, you could. I mean, you could always. You might get them. by, and you might not. Might is kind of that's the risk for that. You, you you could, but if that's the manager, and the manager's leaving. It's like okay, well, I want my reps to be using your platform. Like who? You're not going to go to the CEO. You know, in a bigger company, you'll be like okay, well, 
let's wait for that new manager to come in in three weeks and then talk to the manager and then set up that call with that team so we can get them on board and trained, et cetera. Because it also you really want to do is you want to make sure when that new person comes that you build that relationship now with them. If you go above them and you have that call with that person, you might never meet that manager. And that manager might come in and be like, you know what? I want to try and test out this, this, and this. And I'm going to go to your competitor and get a quote. Try and, you know, a lot of people, when they get a new job and they go into a new job, they're like, I got to put my foot in the door and figure out a way. If it's saving them a thousand bucks, saving them two thousand, making a move in a, in a personnel or a software, they want to do something. They're not going to just come here and be like, well, I'm going to just continue on and doing everything you guys have been doing for last year. So I would definitely try and build that relationship with that new person in, in the role. Fair enough. All right. That was a good this one. This one, uh, th- yeah, that was a good question. Uh, this one's kind of similar to the things that we talk about offline. How do you ensure you're following up enough? So I want advice from other CSMs. I'm having a hard time working out whether I'm reaching out at not enough or too much. It's a fine line. And obviously there are adverse reactions to both. Um, you can annoy the customer. You can get them to go away. You can disengage them or you could not support them enough. And by definition of your job as customer success, if, you, if you're not supporting them, that's bad too. When they may well churn as well. How do we know when we're on the right track and on the right line? Do you want to know what I do? Until that person tells me to F off or leave me alone or I don't want to hear from you or something like that, your job is to be persistent. You know, get, if, if you keep getting an answer, keep going. Find another way. Go on LinkedIn. But I mean, at the end of the day, if you're trying to get a hold of somebody, I never say that deal is closed, lost, or that person's not interested until they've actually told me. I'm not interested. Leave me alone. I'm not the right person. Give me something because at the end of the day, to me, you know, it's it it could be called rejection, but at the same time, it's if you don't get rejection, you don't know where you stand. So I would keep going until you hit the person kind of tells you not to. Yeah, I'd say this is hopefully a rare one, and if it's not a rare thing for you that you're getting to that stage of things, then you have another problem. Maybe you have a sales problem where you're signing crappy deals that should never have really counted. but you know, if you've got a customer and they're just not really picking up the phone, they don't answer any emails, they're not engaging at all, you've got to carry on. You should basically be prepared already for that situation. That's the whole problem. Yep. The, the only time this is a problem is when you don't know what else to do because you've run out of things to say. So there's always material. There's always a video. There's always a new guide. There's always a new feature. There's always a client health check. There's always something that you can pick up on. An example of a similar company, millions of things. You just have to pace it out keep doing it. And then basically until you do get told, no, look, we're going to cancel. It's your account to lose, whether it feels like it or not is another thing. With you. Next one. Oh, oh, this is difficult. Uh, I'm going straight to you for this one. Entry level salary. I'm looking for an entry level CSM role in New York. What is a fair ballpark salary? I'm not going to say anything. I can't wait to hear what you think. That's a great question. So for me, it depends because our CSM role have been in Eastern Europe. So it, the pricing is de- definitely a little bit less than it would be here in North America. The way I would say it is CSM roles typically not the first level that you go into. A lot of people like to go into support and then from support, you go into the CSM role because now you've learned the product, you know, you have knowledgeable. So the one thing I will say is you need to be higher than the support. Um, you have to be higher than the support, but I would say a little bit lower than the actual sales team. Um, entry level in North America, I would say you're probably in the, if you're just starting out, you're probably in the 40, 40 to 50 K range. That's what I would say for a, a, for right away going into a North America, right out of school, a few years out, et cetera. I would say 40 to 50. You're not far off what the comments say. And I think what the comments, the comments being higher than what you've said, is is a reflection of what you just said to you're probably not immediately a csm you're something something and csm yeah. it's kind of like the second or the third step so i'm seeing 60 65 70 uh, 80 somebody's put up to 100 but that's i would be shocked if many people got a 100k job as a as an entry level well so, so it does really depend because 40 to 50 yeah. in the us is 50 to 60 in Canada, right? So, <laughs> yeah, there is that. They're not doing a great job of saying CDN or USD or, exactly. or whatever else. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, give or take, but but they do know it's for NYC. But yeah, probably 100, I'm saying that's, I mean, if that's an entry level job, I, I don't know what you're going to get paid if you're senior there, but um, yeah. that's pretty good. Um, okay, that was a good one. All right. Okay, second to last one. 
uh, unrealistic demands of your time. Oh, this is a good one. So how did Jeffrey, <coughs> Jeffrey, not Sean, Jeffrey, say you have 40 customers and some are higher touch and some are lower touch, some are bigger deals, some are smaller deals, some are new quarterly, some are new monthly, some are yearly. A lot of companies have this type of thing going on. If one of them, and it's nearly always the smaller companies from my experience, if, if one or some of them want so much of your time is disproportionate to the value and uh, just how you would deal with every other customer, that could become a problem if you allow that to continue and to happen and to get worse. What can you do about that? Well, there's a few things you could do. One is you can have tier pricing. And in that tier pricing, you get allocated a certain amount of support. So for example, you might give some people phone support, but some people only email support and some people only intercom chat support or a combination of both. Um, bigger clients, the ones that pay the bills are always the important. Uh, so I always knew, you know, one thing I did know is I knew every single one of, we had, at one point we had 3,000 users, I think, and I knew everyone. I knew every single one, who they were, where they came from, who the big ones are, who the ones we can grow, who the ones that are, you know, are using the platform that are going to be canceling and coming back. Um, so you got to be able to allocate your time. And it's kind of just like sales. I was, I, I was, you know, there was an event yesterday and I was talking about like, People come to our booth and I can know within the first 10 seconds, is that person telling me they're interested in knowing or are they telling me they're interested in knowing so that they can get down to their sales pitch to me? And I will tell you, 85% of the time, it was, you know, what does AutoClose and Vanilla Soft do? And in the back of my head, I'm like, I'm going to give you the 15 second pitch because after 15 seconds, you're going to want to tell me what you're going to do and try and sell me. And it's what happens. So it's just, it's the exact same thing. You with the, with the CSM rule, you want to prioritize your big accounts, prioritize the ones you can grow to prioritize the ones that you know are serious about what you're doing and then go from there. Yeah. I mean, I agree totally. It, the, as I'm just reading the rest of the question here, um, they're not a particularly senior CSM by what, by what I'm reading. So they don't really get to make that call of this is the pricing. This is the tiering. Yeah. But if you, if you can do that, that's definitely the best way because then it's not you ignoring them or it's you telling them, no, it's no, I, I have to do what the pricing says. You got and it. It's like, they're the bad guy. Like, don't, don't come at me about it. So that's definitely the best one. If you can't do that, I've had it before. Um, I think you need to just have, um a not a frank and difficult chat with them but you need to you need to set expectations it's look um generally speaking we have a x uh time response time which is good or yep. we're happy with that or we want to improve it um obviously that means we have to to deal with that with everybody so if i'm ever slower than that i'm trying my best but um you know you have to sort of have an expectation setting with them yep uh, that's part of the pain with smaller customers i'm afraid so that's never really going to go away completely. You can only sort of little it down as best you can. I'm with you. Last one. So um, I'm responsive clients schedule unsolicited meeting question mark. Has your leadership team ever recommended scheduling a direct meeting with a customer who is non-responsive or reaching out to them on social media? Probably LinkedIn is what they're saying. They have a scenario. So customer A has been totally non-responsive to all outreach attempts so far. Leadership recommends just putting a meeting invite on the diary at a random day and time to see if they'll accept and to see if they'll join. What do you think about that? Good strategy or two? I hate when people do that. I don't like when people just book on my calendar because you know what? A, then I sometimes don't know who it is. I'm like, is this an important call? Is this a client? And it makes me do more work than I want it to do. Um, and also you got to be you know, respect people's time. Some people will don't have, you know, they don't have time. They're busy all day. They don't, they can't reach out to you. If they're, you're in a CSM role, if they're a client already and you're a customer success manager, they'll get back to you when they need it. Or they fix the problem themselves and you'll continue to reach out to them. So I absolutely hate when people just book random meetings on my calendar. I agree. I wouldn't do it. Um, I think that also sends the wrong message. Um, if, if you're not getting a response, you know, you have to always look at it as what have I not done? And, yeah. and if you have done absolutely everything, you can do no more. And and you leave it at that. You can only do 100% of what you're able to do. And if they still don't respond, that's still on them. Yeah, they might churn, but you got rid of a crappy client. Exactly. Swings around about. So I, I would not put a, a unsolicited call on anybody's diary personally. Um, I would say your hit rate of that working and going the way that you want is probably sub 10% on that anyway. And uh, if this happens to you very often, you have a different problem which is causing it. And if you're having to do this more than once a week, you're probably going to wait a long time before you actually do turn that around into a good outcome. So um, yep. I wouldn't do that personally. 
All right, Sean, we're out of uh, we're out of Reddit. Well, that, that was, was good. A, that, that, that was a really fun one because we're both not in the CSM role, and uh, I think we answered those questions pretty good. Well, I want to thank everybody for listening today, and if you enjoyed the show, please don't forget to give us a five star review wherever you're listening from, and uh, and subscribe so you don't miss the next show. Listen to our next guests, or just hear all in a uh, weekly rant. Uh, thanks again, and we'll see you guys next time. <laughs>